Welcome to this afternoon's uh, seminar. It's a pleasure to see you all here. During the CHPE seminar series this year, you will be taken to the cutting edge of science every week, except this week. Uh, so this week, I'm going to con continue my annual tradition of giving a non-technical seminar and talking about uh, some of the things that we can all do to help uh, make the research work that we do better. Before I get into what this title is all about, though, I want to make a couple of announcements. And so I'd like to welcome a couple of new arrivals. Professor Yu Hang Hu is right here in the middle. So welcome to Yu Hang. <laughs> Yu Hang is an assistant professor who has already had some faculty experience at the University of Illinois, is joining us. She is a uh, joint appointment between chemical engineering and mechanical engineering. So we're very glad to have you here. Also with us here today is John Blazik. There's John over there. John will be joining us as an assistant professor in the spring. Now you can see in this photo he's not smiling. That's because he's not at Georgia Tech yet. So, so in the spring he'll be here and we'll have a different photo of him smiling. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of successes in the school over the past few months or so. Uh, the Department of Energy and Energy Frontier Research Center that's headed by Professor Walton and with uh, Professor Jones and myself as deputy directors has been funded for a second phase. So we've received another $11 million from DOE. This is the result of many, many people in this room actually uh, contributing work to the center and so that's a great success. And in a similar vein, uh, Professor Hang Lu is the co-director of a new Southeast Center for Mathematics and Biology and this is about $11 million that's coming from the NSF and the Simons Foundation. Now one thing that's in common with all the people you see on this slide is that their success has come from many, many years of sustained work. And really that's going to be the topic of the talk today is how do we organize our personal time and our effort so that we can do the things that we know will lead to our long-term achievement. So that's going to be the topic for this afternoon. But first I'm going to do something I've always wanted to do this in a seminar. So okay, you've, you've been to a concert or something like that. Everyone pulls out their cell phone and waves it in the air. So I want you to help me here. Pull out your phone. Come on. You can do it. You've all got your phones here. I know it. That's it. Wave it around. All right. That uh, looks so cool. All right. But now I want you to keep your phone in your hand and I want you to turn it off. <laughs> not set it to mute, not set it to buzz, but actually turn it off. So you know you can do that, right? It's not going to hurt you. And one of the things I want you to think about is actually what it takes to really truly concentrate on something for a few minutes. Now if you have a close relative who's on an operating table right now, you could leave your phone on, but otherwise you're not going to need it for the next few minutes. All right, so the talk today is based on this book by a guy called Cal Newport. His book is called Deep Work. Cal is an associate professor of computer science at Georgetown University. He's written extensively about work productivity, but he's also a very, very effective uh, academic researcher. And so he offers this definition of deep work that'll be sort of the starting point for us today. He says deep work is professional activities done in a distraction-free state that push cognitive capabilities to their limit. And I'm going to argue that we all know what this is like. Okay, so when you are truly concentrating on something, it's actually an enjoyable thing to do, and so you can identify when you are doing this. And I think you would also agree with me that the more you can achieve this state, the more you can actually get done in your work life. So that's what we'll be talking about today. I want to mention that I'm going to tell you some anecdotes that come from several other books. Uh, Atomic Adventures is a book written by a Georgia Tech alum, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. The Drug Hunters is a fascinating book about uh, the world of drug discovery. And then Daily Rituals is a book that just accumulates information about how famous artists and uh, some scientists, just how they organize their day. And finally, I'll mention a paper from this uh, journal, Biological Bulletin, which sounds like a hideously boring thing to read, but actually I'd strongly recommend that you read this paper. It's very, very entertaining, and we'll get to part of that later in the talk. All right, so let's talk about the title. I've already told you what deep work is, and I think you can all identify what that is. Uh, we can also talk about shallow work. So Cal Newport defines this as undemanding logistical style tasks often <coughs> performed while distracted. I'm not going to argue that this is unimportant. So this is things like 
completing your annual ethics training, changing the oil in your vacuum pump, calibrating an instrument in your lab. There are many, many things that you have to do in your professional life and you have to do them in a timely way, but they don't involve deep work. Okay, and so they're just things that we have to get done, so in a sense we can get on to the real work of what we're trying to do. Now the, the thing that I'm going to add to Cal Newport's uh, taxonomy here is this idea of frippery. This is a pretty old-fashioned word. Not all of you might know this word, but you can probably guess what it means. It means this. Okay, so frippery is stuff, it's the empty calories of time management. Okay, it's not necessarily bad for you, but it's not good for you either. It just kind of fills up your time. And one of the challenges in life today, and one of the reasons I urged you to turn off your phone, is that we are surrounded by these things. And it, they are really set up in a way to keep our attention and draw our attention more and more. And so we'll talk about ways to uh, avoid this idea of frippery so we can get more of the deep work done. All right, so let's talk about some of the characteristics of deep work. One of the characteristics of deep work is simply that it takes a long, sustained effort to achieve something that's really significant. And to illustrate this, I'm going to take you back to an episode in Georgia Tech history that illustrates the opposite of this. All right, so on Thursday, March the 23rd, 1989, I'm going to ask you to pay close attention to the dates because they actually matter here. These two gentlemen, Martin Fleischman and Stanley Pons, had a press conference in Utah and they announced that they had discovered how to achieve fusion at room temperature in a tabletop device. This was worldwide news. This took what people thought was impossible in terms of thermonuclear fusion and said, you can actually just do it on this desktop right here. People didn't look before. And so the promise is energy too cheap to meter. This was going to revolutionize the world. By coincidence, the next day, the Exxon company managed to run aground a gigantic oil tanker in Alaska. This at the time was the largest oil spill that had occurred in the world. And so you can imagine that there's just tremendous interest in finding clean sources of energy. And there's no way to say it other than that a gold rush started in the scientific community to reproduce the work that Pons and Fleischmann had been doing. The next Wednesday, March the 29th, uh, Bill Mahaffey here at GTRI submitted a proposal asking internally GTRI to provide him for $25,000. Now, this is going to make all of my faculty colleagues sad. He submitted his proposal in the morning. It was funded in the afternoon. <laughs> Doesn't always work like that. Okay, so they've got their money. They start procuring. They've got to get a palladium electro. They've got to get electrochemical cell. They've got to get neutron detectors. They get all this stuff together. It takes them about a week to do that. Finally, on Saturday, April the 8th, so this is now about two weeks after Pons and Fleischmann's announcement, uh, they start their experiment to run. By the way, Pons and Fleischmann haven't published anything this. Uh, so far, the GTRI team, they've entirely based their experiment on what they note they saw on the television news. Okay, they sort of took still images and that's what they used. So they start to run their experiment on Saturday, and there's people all over the world trying to do this. The thing that's really cool about this experiment is it works. It actually shows that they're generating heat, they're generating neutrons. That means they have fusion. All right, so what do they do? Georgia Tech gets everyone together. They call a news conference. On Monday morning, they have a news conference. I talked to John Toon, who's still here at Georgia Tech. He said they had people fly in from everywhere for this news conference. And they announce that they have cold fusion. It's national news coverage. So here is, this is just from the front page of the Atlanta paper. There's no question it's fusion, said Dr. Livesay. I still don't believe it, even though I see it. It happened so soon we thought it was an equipment malfunction, said Dr. Mahaffey. Yeah, you'll see that he'll, he's regretted those words. <laughs> but to give you a sense of the, you know, what gripped the scientific world, about the next day there was another article in the paper, and I'm just going to read a, a quote from that, uh, which it says, Duke University graduate student James Langenbrunner helped build three cold fusion cells within eight days of the Pons Fleischmann announcement and missed his girlfriend's birthday party in the process. <laughs> we were busy, he explained. He's reluctant to return to his pre-cold fusion work in nuclear physics. Quote, you don't know what a drag it is to use that accelerator. You can work for days without getting any usable data at all. 
<laughs> so probably he uh, also regrets having that in the newspaper, I suspect. Now, unfortunately, this story doesn't have a happy ending. You know that we don't have cold fusion uh, producing energy today. That's because it's not a real scientific effect. And it turns out that there was a mistake in the Georgia Tech uh, experiments. What they didn't know was as their neutron detector heated up, which was what the cell was doing, it would give a signal as though it was detecting neutrons. In fact, there were no neutrons. Georgia Tech took the very bold step of calling another news conference. So they had another news conference on Thursday, and then here are stories from the Atlantic Constitution and the New York Times the next day. So they had to admit that, uh, in fact, they hadn't seen fusion. And the next Tuesday, there's a, a, yet another story in the newspaper about this. So there's lots of lessons that we can draw from this. Uh, one lesson is be very careful how you talk to the press about your research. And actually, one outcome of this is to this day, Georgia Tech is incredibly reticent to hold an actual news conference about research. Uh, they, we will re issue press releases, but not do a news conference. But the real point I want to get across here is, in a sense, just the timeline here should tell us what we already sensed was true. That it's really difficult to believe you could make a major earth-shattering scientific discovery just based on a few days worth of work. Okay, so doing something that really makes a difference uh, in the research community takes a significant amount of time. Well, I've already indicated then that doing deep work is hard because it takes a lot of time. Why should we even try and do it? Now, I hope actually I don't have to convince you of this, but I'll just mention a couple of quotes from Newport's book. He points out that deep work is becoming increasingly rare, but increasingly valuable. Those who make it the core of their working life will thrive. Our culture's shift towards the shallow is exposing a massive opportunity for the few who prioritize depth. This is actually worth thinking about quite carefully. Many of you are just starting your PhD and you have a chance to really sort of establish patterns of work that you'll probably follow for many, many years. And what he's pointing out here is that if you are willing to organize your time and organize your life so that you truly work in a deep way, that will give you an enormous advantage over the great majority of people who are simply not willing to do that. All right, another characteristic of deep work is that it's valuable. So here's a picture of Marie Curie. Just sitting outside my office is a reproduction of this amazing photograph from 1911. Uh, I know the labels are too small to read, but you can come and visit my office and see them below the picture as well. This was a conference that got together everybody who was anybody in physics in about 1911. So you can look at this picture. Uh, there's Einstein there. There's, you, know, we, you can go down the list, many of these names that you know. One of the things that strikes me, of course, this was an era when gentlemen had what I would call heroic facial hair, right? And so in particular, right in the middle of the picture there, uh, that's Knudsen, who we now know in terms of uh, Knudsen flow. He has a particularly impressive mustache, I think. So what you see, though, is this, there's one woman in the room, and that's Marie Curie. And by the way, she can't be bothered to be part of this conference photograph. She's busy having a technical discussion with Poincaré, the great mathematician, sitting next to her. Marie Curie is a wonderful example of someone who reaped uh, the rewards, I would say, of sustained deep work. I would actually also argue that even though she was thought of as a chemist and a physicist, I'll show you she was actually a chemical engineer. So the thing that she did that brought her great fame was she realized that there must be some highly radioactive element hidden away in the ore that also contains uranium. And so she used crystallization, this is the chemical engineering part, where she started with a ton of this ore and working in a tiny unheated shed, she managed to crystallize that until she purified 0.1 grams of radium chloride. This was the first time that radium had ever been produced. Now, again, this was a time when, uh, of course, the men who were in charge of things didn't, weren't really very impressed by women doing science. And so it took many, many years before she was recognized for her work. Her department where she worked finally in June of 1903 decided that she should be given her PhD. Turns out that whoever was the department head made a pretty good choice because later that year she won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, so, you know, just in time was good enough. Uh, and, you know, 
Many of you are just starting your PhD, so you want to aim high, I think. And so, uh, <laughs> now, it turns out she didn't stop there. She won another Nobel Prize eight years ago, this one by herself. She's one of very, very few people who won uh, two different Nobel Prizes. This is an example, again, I want to emphasize the value of deep work. This wasn't just grunt work in the lab. She had conceived in a theoretical way that there had to be an element out there, and so her conception of the science uh, was what drove her to do these things. I'm also going to argue that deep work is rare. That if you look around our society, most people don't want to do it, and the people who are willing to do it really can make a big mark. And so the example that I'm going to give here is two gentlemen who were assistant professors at Yale Medical School in the 1930s. So I just introduced two assistant professors to you, and they're starting their careers. They need to think about all the things they need to do to get tenure. But one of the things that happened to these two individuals is they were assigned to teach the pharmacology course. And at that time, pharmacology was really not a well-defined field. They had the experience that's extremely common as a university professor, which is they looked at the books that were available and they didn't like any of the books. They decided, well, the solution is we should write a book, right? Looking at the assistant professors, do not do this, okay? <laughs> but they decided to write a book and they wrote a field-defining book. So by 1941, they'd written their textbook. It was over a million words long. That's longer than the King James Bible, by the way. But this book completely redefined the field of pharmacology. It turned this field from an anecdotally driven area into something that's now based on evidence. And this book is still the standard reference uh, in pharmacology. So it's now in their 12th edition. The gentlemen have long since passed away. So there's other authors uh, who are now involved. Now, you might imagine that they spent so much time writing this book that they probably didn't get too much else done. You would be wrong. So around the same time, working together, they developed the first chemotherapy agent. So they were the first people to cure a cancer using chemotherapy. That alone is you know, really an amazing achievement. I just want to tell you one footnote about these guys. So a number of years later, Goodman had moved to the University of Utah and he'd got interested in developing new anesthetics. There's always a need for good anesthetics. And he knew that there's a, a compound called curare, which South American tribes put on their blow darts, and it's a paralyzing poison. So he decided this might make a good anesthetic. He convinced his department head to let him inject his department head with curare. <laughs> Don't ask, Corey. I'm not going to do it for you. OK? So, the department head's instructions were, you will probably, your muscles will be paralyzed. Then we will prick you with pins, and you should communicate by blinking whether it hurts. OK? <laughs> so sure enough, the guy becomes paralyzed. They start poking him with pins, and he blinks like crazy. It hurts, right? So he's paralyzed, but it's not an anesthetic. So the, the experiment is a bust. Unfortunately, a few minutes later, the department head stopped breathing. OK, so that's not good. So that fortunately, the, the professor was also a doctor. And so he artificially ventilated the guy until finally it wore off and everyone was happy. So you know, this, uh, th it was a different era of drug discovery back then. <laughs> All right, but this is so the example is that deep work is valuable. Deep work uh, is rare. I'm also going to argue that it's a fundamentally meaningful thing to do, that if you get engaged in doing deep work, you don't do it for other people. You do it for yourself because it's a fundamentally satisfying thing to do. Many of you will know what this image is. If you open up any biologically oriented journal, you'll see a photo or, or an image like this that uses green fluorescent protein uh, in order to label various things. So this was actually discovered by this gentleman, Osama Shimomura, who has an interesting life. He was actually uh, living in Nagasaki when the atomic bomb was dropped in Nagasaki at the end of the Second World War. And so as a young boy, he had fallout rain down on his head. Uh, he then grew up in a very poor surroundings because post-World War II, Japan really had very few resources. He ultimately came to the United States and became a scientist. He was engaged when he first came in trying to understand a jellyfish that expresses a protein that fluoresces. 
Okay, so that sounds like an interesting thing to do. It turns out this is pretty hard work and it's all described in this paper I mentioned at the bottom. Notice that the paper is written many, many years before he got the Nobel Prize, long before he was really recognized for this work. And as I said, it's a very actually entertaining paper. I'd highly recommend you take a look at it. So in 1960, uh, he started collecting jellyfish and he, in that first summer, he collected 10,000 jellyfish. And each jellyfish he had to catch in the ocean, then he had to dissect it in a very, very particular way to get the sample of what he needed. So you can tell that he really needed some strong motivation uh, to do this. Over the next 20 years, he continued to do this. After a few years, he realized that he could probably solve the structure of the molecule, but he needed a fraction of a gram of the chromophore. That meant he, had, he needed two and a half tons of jellyfish. And so he spent the next couple of years in the summers fishing jellyfish out of the ocean, dissecting them. He developed a machine that would dissect them, all kinds of things to increase the throughput. Uh, but he spent a lot of time up to his elbows in jellyfish. That continued, as I said, over the next 20 years. Now this guy maybe needed a chemical engineer to work with him because he improved the yield to the point where 50,000 jellyfish gave him half a gram, right? So that's still not very much. The point that I want to make here, though, is that Ultimately, he won the Nobel Prize, and I'm sure that was a wonderful thing for him. But that was many, many years, decades after he did the work. That fundamentally, he was doing this work because he was interested in solving a scientific problem, and he had habits of work that allowed him to do it. Uh, I won't go through all the details, but again, in his paper, he describes many of the situations that he went through and the innovations that were made in order to do uh, the work that he could do. All right, well, so far, I've talked about what deep work is, and I've argued that it's rare, it's valuable, and it's meaningful. Now, hopefully, I didn't really need to convince you of all that stuff, but I think it is worth recognizing that this is not just something that's nice to have in your life. This can be a life-changing thing for you, that if you really are able to do this, uh, it can be a very, very deeply satisfying thing to do. Well, now what we need to talk about is how do we actually get there? How do we change from the way that I use my time today, you use your time, so that we can do more of this deep work stuff. So the first idea that Newport describes in his book is a very simple one, and that is that you need to train yourself to do this. It does not happen by accident. And I've got a photograph here of uh, Jessica Diggins and Kirk and Randall. These were the first US athletes to win medals in uh, cross-country skiing in the Winter Olympics. And they, like all elite athletes, you can imagine they don't just train part of the time. They train day in, day out, and their training doesn't just consist of the exercise they do, but they pay attention to their diet and their sleep. It's an entire lifestyle. And part of the idea here is that to be really effective in the long term in terms of doing deep work, it has to be a lifestyle. You have to really have a way where you start to organize your life around it. And the goal uh, is in order to get there. Now, it's true that many things in our society uh, mitigate against us doing that, including uh, the tendency for all of us to want to multitask. And so I actually have a couple of helpers here who are going to help illustrate this. So I want to welcome a couple of members of the Wheeler High School Marching Band. Come on out, guys. So they're going to help me out. So you can see that it's quite difficult. There's a lot of things going on. You've got these distractions going on. There's all sorts of things happening. It makes it incredibly difficult. Round of applause for Eddie and Martin. Thank you very much, gentlemen. You can return your uh, ears to their usual setting now. The point that I was trying to make here is that if you believe you can multitask and do deep work, you are mistaken. Okay, so doing deep work is something that really involves uh, trying to find some concentrated space. Now, a misconception often when people think about this kind of work is, that's what I should be doing all the time. 
And I want to assure you that that is not true. Let me remind you of our definition. This is something that pushes your cognitive capabilities to their limit. That straight away implies that you can't do this all the time. If you can do this for a few hours a day, uh, that's really a wonderful thing to do. We all have these shallow work tasks that I talked about before that are still important in our life. We still have to uh, get them done and make them happen. So I'm going to argue that doing 100% deep work is not the goal. Uh, my example for this is H.L. Mencken. So this is a guy who lived around the turn of the last century. He was one of the most prominent uh, authors and social critics at that time. He worked 12 to 14 hours every day. Now, I know some of my colleagues are thinking here that he would be a perfect graduate student, right? <laughs> he's going to be in the lab all the time. Now, one of the things about H.L. Mencken is he's, he's a really quotable guy. So he said, for instance, for every complex problem, there's an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. <laughs> he also said, a man may be a fool and not know it, but not if he is married. <laughs> Looking at some of my older colleagues here who are nodding knowingly, yes. Uh, okay, so how did Mencken organize his time? As I said, every single day, 12 to 14 hours of work. It turns out that in the morning, he basically spent his time reading some stuff and answering his mail. So it's, I feel like that's what I do. I answer my email. He was basically doing that. He wrote over 100,000 letters in his lifetime. So he was pretty serious about answering his mail. He spent the afternoon doing editorial things. He was a journalist, and so he had to make sure that things were working. Only in the evening did he work in a concentrated way on writing. And so this is one example of someone who's organized their day. He presumably found that he could most effectively work in the evening, but he deliberately set up the schedule of his life so that he could focus on the thing that he really wanted to get done. Now I'm going to make this claim that if you can train yourself to work deeply for three to four hours a day, you could get an amazing amount of stuff done. Now I'm hoping that all of you are at work for more than three to four hours a day, but there are all these other tasks that we have to get done. If you can train yourself so that you can set aside the distractions, set aside your phone, close down your email, do all those things, and truly focus for three to four hours a day, that would be a, really an amazing amount of uh, productivity that you could develop. So this is an example of this, the idea that in order to do deep work, it's really important to develop either a ritual or a strategy. A ritual might be something as simple as you'll make yourself a strong cup of coffee when you start that period of work. A schedule is sort of self-explanatory. I want to show uh, some data that I've actually shown before in one of these talks, but I find very persuasive. So this was a study done a number of years ago about professors trying to write. So all of us who are professors feel guilty that we don't get enough writing done. And so they took a bunch of professors and they were randomly assigned into three categories. One category was told, don't write anything. Not allowed to write anything unless it's truly an emergency. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, one group was told to be spontaneous. This is what we all think we could do, right? Just write when you feel Everything, you've got some wonderful idea to write it down. The last group was told, just make a schedule. Just sit down and write these 50 times whether you think you have anything to say or not. And so the people doing this study then measured how much people wrote. It's not surprising that the people who scheduled their time wrote more. Okay, so this is in pages per day. And the schedule group writes enormously more than the other two groups. Now you might look at this and you think, well sure, that's fine. But they're not writing anything that's good, they're just writing something. They asked the participants in the study to self-assess how many creative ideas they had. So what's being shown here is the interval between creative ideas. And what I want you to notice is the group that scheduled their time, they came up with way more creative ideas. So this is actually a very, very simple idea that you shouldn't wait for motivation to strike you. You should just decide. I am going to sit down and work in a concentrated way from 9 to 11 in, in the morning or whatever. You have to decide something that works for you, uh, but this will make a tremendous difference. I want to give you a personal example of doing this. So I'm a relatively busy guy. I travel quite a lot. Uh, to give you a hint of how much I travel, I got on a flight last week down at the airport and as I was getting on, the lady who was welcoming people on the plane said, 
I think I recognize you, welcome back. <laughs> That's really a sign that maybe I'm traveling too much. So a couple of years ago, I decided, you know, I'm gonna try and use my time sitting on a plane in a different way. I'm not gonna try and catch up on the manuscripts from my group, sorry guys. Uh, I'm not gonna check my email or read a book or watch a movie. Instead, I'm gonna try and write something. And after 18 months, I finished a novel. Now, I am not gonna claim that this is the great American novel. Okay? It's just, a, it's just a novel, about 80,000 words long. I will say that I've had a couple of people who are not related to me tell me they liked it, so that was good. <laughs> but my point is that if someone came to you tonight and said, do you think you could finish a novel between now and a year from now? Most of you would think, that's crazy, I can't possibly do that. Actually, you could, if you allocated your time uh, in a particular way. I got into the habit that as soon as I sat down on the plane, I would open up my laptop and I would start uh, working on this novel. And to be honest, I found it made the travel much more enjoyable than when I, I was trying to amuse myself before on the plane. The next piece of advice that uh, Newport has in his book is that we need to embrace boredom. I want you to imagine for a moment that uh, it's lunchtime, you've headed over to the student center and you're waiting in line to order your lunch. You're there by yourself. What do you do? You're pretty sure for many of you, we do this, <laughs> right? I know I would. I'm gonna pull out my phone and there'll be something that I can look at. This has really become incredibly common now. If you see people <laughs> waiting for stuff, you know, no one's, you're not gonna talk to the people around you. You wouldn't wanna do that. So instead, you're gonna look at your phone. And I wanna go back and talk about Shimomura. So in his article, he describes that every day they had to do all this work, you know, slopping up the jellyfish and cutting them up and all that kind of stuff. But the, a key insight that came to him about how to imagine this whole process that he was working on occurred because each day he would take a rowboat out and he would just kind of let it drift around in the water and he would sit in the rowboat. And he said, there was, I had no goal, I was just, out there sitting in the rowboat, but he wasn't doing anything and his mind was percolating over the problems that he had. And in fact, he had an insight that then ultimately led him to, many, many years later, winning the Nobel Prize. Now I want you to think about how this would work for each of us. So we'd get the rowboat, that would be good, and then you'd think, well, you know, I've got to take a photograph of the rowboat, <laughs> right? So you pull out your phone, uh, to take a photograph of the rowboat, and then sure enough, you realize there are all these other things that you can look at on your phone. You know, you can send an image to your mother, uh, you can do all these things. All these things are fine, but they have trained us to not be bored. And so Newport's advice, which I really think is powerful, is that we need to actively have times in our life when we're sort of not doing anything, and we just let our minds uh, rotate over problems that we're working on, if we are always giving ourselves external stimuli, it's gonna cut down on the creativity uh, that you can have. As I said at the top there, your time is a zero-sum game. Once you've spent an hour or 45 minutes sitting here listening to me, you do not get that time back. So I'm sorry for that, but that's the way it works with every hour. The implication here is that when we have all these things that are potential tools that we can use, that we really should be careful about which ones we decide to use. So Newport actually argues you should get off social media completely. Just go to zero. There are other people uh, who, who have argued that. And maybe that's not necessary. But let's think about how you choose, let's say, which of these electronic tools to use. Now a typical way that I would maybe choose is I would say, well, I'm going to look at Instagram. By the way, I'm not sure I even understand how Instagram works, so this is a hypothetical example. But I would think, is there some benefit to my life that I could identify if I used Instagram? And the answer is, sure, right? I'm sure I could be delivered an, an unending series of pictures of budgerigars or something that would make me happy, right? That's the wrong question to ask. A better question to ask is, is the time I'm using with that tool, is that actually getting me somewhere that I want to go in the long term? And so I'm gonna illustrate a tool that Newport recommends, which I think is very, very effective. 
when you're trying to evaluate this question. So let's imagine that I use Instagram or Twitter regularly. He argues you should do the following. You should just stop for one month. You don't tell anyone you're going to do it. You just decide, I'm going to uninstall this thing from my phone. I'm going to stop for a month. And then just wait and see what happens. By the way, uh, one of our colleagues here, Dr. Walton, who couldn't be here this afternoon, did exactly this. So it turned out a couple of years ago, she got in the habit of using Twitter. There are, I guess, good reasons to be on Twitter, but you know, she found it that it really took up a lot of her time. And so earlier this year, she decided to try exactly this. She just stopped using Twitter for a month. And then after a month, you ask yourself the following two questions. Would the last 30 days have been substantially better, not just a little bit better, but substantially better if I was using the tool? And did people who are truly important to me care that I wasn't using the tool? Of course there's someone out there who misses you, but are they people that are genuinely important to you? Now Newport suggests that if you answer both of those questions with no, you have just made a useful decision, you should never go back to using that tool. It's just sucking up your time and not uh, using things in a useful way. I know from Dr. Walton, when she spent a month not using Twitter, that's exactly the decision she came to. She said she's actually considerably happier now uh, for not doing it. I've done a similar thing with some other uh, electronic-based things that I, I used to use regularly. Even if one of the answers is just weakly yes, I would argue you should, you should still think about not doing it. Okay, remember that these kinds of things are designed very, very carefully to capture and hold your attention. They are not designed with your best interests in mind. They are just designed to glue your eyeballs uh, to a device. All right, so what we've talked about today is this idea of deep work. I think intuitively we all know what it is, but I want to emphasize again that if you can organize your time to do deep work, it's actually an extremely satisfying thing to do. And it can really enhance not just your professional success, but your joy and satisfaction in the work uh, that you do. I've argued that there are several strategies you should think about in order to enhance your ability to, deep, to do deep work. First of all, you should actually think about how to train yourself to do it. It's not going to happen by accident. It doesn't happen just by doing it alone. You do have to think in a sort of holistic way about all the different ways that you spend time. You need to set deep work schedules and rituals. If you just wait for it to happen, it is not going to happen. And so you really have to find ways that you can organize your time, block all those other things out from around you, and spend time doing these things. You need to learn to embrace boredom. Do the experiment. By the way, all of you managed to turn off your phone for about 40 minutes, so that's a good start, right? You're probably really bored at the moment, but this is a good thing to do. Next time you're standing in line for food, try not looking at your phone. See what happens. And finally, I argue that you should make conscious choices about the resources and the way that you spend your life. I said at the beginning that there's deep work, there's shallow work, and there's frippery. The thing that you need to try and strip away is frippery. It's not bad, but as I said, it's sort of the empty calories of time. And so instead of just letting those things fill in your time, really make conscious choices about how you spend your time, the things that you enjoy doing, uh, and spend your time doing those things. So I hope this is useful to you. Uh, this brings me to the end of my talk. Thanks for your attention, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Thanks. Everyone's either dying to get back to the lab or dying to check out what's on their phone. I'm not quite sure which. <laughs> Lily. I would suggest using the scheduling time not only for writing but also for reading. Yes, Lily, that's a very good, and the comment in case you didn't hear it was the idea of scheduling time. I showed it for writing. I would argue it's for all aspects of deep work. And so it's for, it's for thinking, it's for reading. Uh, really, the idea is to set aside that time to really uh, focus on what you're trying to do. Very good comment. Thanks. Yes? Uh, so, for instance, you talked about a lot of the things we can do as people, like changes to ourselves. But when it comes to, I guess, your work environment, 
like if you're at home, obviously you can make improvements to that, but I guess as PhD students, typically you share offices with you know multiple other students, so that puts a lot of extra variables in there, a lot of extra distractions. So what would you recommend to do in like say a public environment like that where distractions are coming from all different directions? Yeah, a great great question about how do you deal with I mean just all the constraints that are placed on you. Um, I mean, I'll give you a personal example. Uh, Lori, who was here before, has control of my calendar and is, it's her job to put stuff on my calendar. Things show up all the time. I've blocked out times when she knows not to do that because that's my time to do this kind of work. You have to sort of take proactive steps to do it. It might involve going and working in a different environment. Go and sit in a coffee shop or work at home, come in early, stay late. But just think about it in a proactive way, because you're exactly right. There's always things around you, either external or actually internal, that will seek to distract us from what we're doing. Matthew. Do you think that deep work can ever be collaborative work, or do you think it is a sole activity? Ah, that's a very good, no, I think it definitely can be collaborative work. Um, there certainly are instances, right, where and I, I think another way to rephrase your question is when we collaborate with others, how do we achieve that state of deep work over time? And again, I would say it takes a long, long time because you need to be sort of attuned to what people are thinking. Yeah, it's, that's a great idea. Mark, did you have a question? We're just, you're just hoping. At this seminar last year, <laughs> one of my illustrations involved a cold beer. And I was asked by several of my colleagues, if I sit in the front, do I get a beer? <laughs> Sorry, not this time. I, I actually was going to ask, uh, are there any classes of human experimentation that you would be willing to volunteer for for your faculty? <laughs> but they're all going to have to go through an IRB. So, you know, as long as we do that, then, yeah, but new anesthetics are definitely off the table. <laughs> Yes? Uh, you mentioned like, how the society is valuing shadow work more or valuing deep work less, right? So doesn't that take away incentive to do deep work as well? Why, so I think what I meant to say is the pressures on all of us are, there's so many things that sort of nudge us towards doing shallow work. Uh, that doesn't mean that there is less value in doing deep work. So actually, you know, to, to really accomplish things, you have to spend time doing deep work. But you're right that often uh, companies and work environments and things like that are sort of set up almost oppositionally to it. So it's, it's a challenge, I think. All right, well, thank you again for your attention. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>